Welcome to the Finding Gravitas podcast, brought to you by Gravitas Detroit. Looking to become a more authentic leader? Finding Gravitas is the podcast for you. Gravitas is the ultimate leadership quality that draws people in. It's an irresistible force encompassing all the traits of authentic leadership. Join your podcast host, Jan Griffiths, that passionate, rebellious farmer's daughter from Wales, entrepreneur, leadership coach, keynote speaker, one of the top 100 leading women in the automotive industry, as she interviews some of the finest leadership minds in the quest for Gravitas. In this episode, you'll meet David Chislett. David wants to activate creativity in as many people as he can. And in his own words, he wants to turn people into weapons of mass creation. Wow, that's a powerful statement. He understands creativity better than anybody I have met. And if you're anything like me, you struggle a bit with this term creativity and innovation. What is the relationship between the two? How do you unleash creativity in your team? It's difficult to get your mind around that. David debunks many of the myths that we have around the subject, and we go deep into what creativity really is and how to access it. David Chislett, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Very nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me along. Now, you are quite an interesting fellow, (laughs) to say the least. So first of all, first and foremost, what's your story? Right from the very beginning, where were you born and what brought you to where you are today? Wow. Well, yeah, I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> no, please, let's go. That's, I, I think uh, it would be really fascinating to understand your story. All right. Well, I was born in a harbour town called Portsmouth in the southeast of England. And my family emigrated by ship to South Africa in 1974. Uh, which is where I went to school, went to university, where weirdly enough, I even got constricted into the military for two years. And eventually, when I was halfway through a postgraduate degree, I decided that academic life was not for me, and I fled South Africa for the bright lights of London. In part, I guess, because as an English-speaking South African, I'd never been made to feel particularly South African or particularly like I belonged. Six months in London and I realized I was a lot more South African than I thought. But nonetheless, I stayed there for two years, uh, worked in television in post-production, also worked as a radio journalist reporting back to national pop radio in South Africa and started my career as a music journalist. And then after nearly two years, friends talked a hole in my head and persuaded me to go back to South Africa, where I then started my own band management and promotion agency, where I ran a small stable of artists uh, for a few years before fleeing back to London, before fleeing back to South Africa, from Joburg down to Cape Town, uh, more band management, more promotions, um, then ended up working in book publishing, marketing in particular, before going back to London and working for a large live events agency in Soho. Um, Then back to South Africa again for another 10 years where I began publishing a lot of my own work and started getting involved in training for the first time, running workshops um, on the business of the music industry, leadership skills and various other things. And then Coming towards eight years ago now, I left South Africa to go traveling the world, just decided I needed a break. Those last 10 years in Joburg had been pretty intensive, and I really needed a bit of downtime to uh, recuperate. And so when I left, people were like, well, how long are you going for? And I was, don't know, six months, six years, no idea. And yeah, I'm now married. We have two kids and a house in the suburbs. I'm not going anywhere. And... um, this move to the Netherlands is also what precipitated a major change in direction for me because I was living in a non-English speaking country for the first time in my life. My entire professional skill set depended on native speaker skills. So there was no way I was going to be a marketing specialist or a journalist in Dutch. 
seven years later, I still don't think I, my Dutch is good enough to do that. And, and that's when the, the threads of all of these things that I'd done in the past sort of started to coalesce. The, the training, the management, the promoting began to realize that what I'd been doing my entire life was helping people and helping people to realize their creative ambitions. And with always this idea that the people I was helping had something to offer the world to make it a better place. And um, with the help of a friend of mine, I was able to bring that into really stark focus and to understand that actually for the first time in my life, I was like, oh, I have a purpose. I want to change the world for the better. And how am I going to do that? By activating creativity in as many people as I possibly can. Wow. And so here you are today with your own business doing exactly that. Indeed. Yeah. It's been an interesting ride. <laughs> yeah. The life of the entrepreneur. It is indeed. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, authentic leadership. Hmm. One of the uh, basic traits or tenets of authentic leadership, if you will, is this ability to inspire and ignite performance in people on your team. Yeah. And inspire and ignite creativity. And we talk a lot about innovation and creativity. And yes. often in the corporate world, innovation is considered this thing that maybe the engineering guy or the R&D person is responsible for. Well, just come up with a, you know, a better widget that's more innovative. Um, yeah. or, or maybe they've got some crazy guy, usually may, maybe a PhD who's been in the business forever knows everything about the product and he's responsible for, or she is responsible for new, new products and programs. Yeah. And so, you know, you see leaders going, well, ch I checked the box on innovation. I've got somebody working on that. Yeah. And that seems to me like that's so wrong because innovation is how you think it's about your culture. It's so much broader than that. Yes, and I, I know this instinctively but I don't have the skills or the ability to go down deeper. Right. You do. You mm -hmm. go right down into creativity and innovation. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on this podcast to educate our audience, the business leaders out there on what exactly is creativity and innovation and how, how do they inspire that in their teams and their businesses? So there's the question. <laughs> All right. Well, the way I look at it is that innovation is one of the products of creativity in the same way that art uh, is a product of creativity or music um, or the solution to a particular problem. You know, creativity is not to be mistaken with things. It's more like a process. It's this capacity that we as human beings have. Now, when you're in a business situation, you're talking about wanting more innovation, you need to be able to meet the conditions of creativity in order to get the innovation. And one of the first things where a lot of businesses normally run afoul of is that in order to get into a creative mindset on a repeatable, reliable basis, in order to work through the process of coming up with new ideas that may result in innovation, you need safe space. And unfortunately, KPIs and KPAs and uh, measuring everything and setting fixed goals and outputs is exactly the opposite of the kind of safe space that is required for creativity. So merely by the way that we choose to manage our people, even if they are in an innovation factory, is quite often counterproductive. The other big issue is the fact that we have an innovation factory, that we are sitting with our creative genii, or just that person, in a silo that is not connected to anything else, because we're then creating, we're then treating creativity as a discrete thing, and it's not. You know, creativity is is an open-ended system. The easiest way to explain what creativity actually is is to say, well. It's essentially a process of joining the dots. Now, if you have one person or one team in a silo, supposedly coming up with innovation, you have a limited number of dots which they can join. They're not allowed to step outside of that silo to find new or interesting dots. So quite often, the things that they come up with 
don't actually result in much. And we're starting to see a lot of research and responses coming out now where people are basically saying that the innovation team, the innovation factory, isn't actually delivering anything of use. But if you think about your average large organization employing anywhere from, say, 4,000 to 40,000 individuals, that's an awful lot of brain power. That's an awful lot of dots. Now, if you are truly committed to innovation, you need to have a culture where it is safe and encouraged and acceptable for people to come forward with ideas. For the guy in the blue overall who delivers the widgets to say, you know what? If you change the product in X, Y, or Z way, it would be so much easier to deliver. It would cut down on time, which means I could deliver more, which means you could employ less people, which would result in a significant saving, and the customers would be really pleased. You make their lives interesting. It would be a great innovation. But most often, there is no structure in place to accept such feedback, and there is also no will or no culture that encourages that kind of feedback. So if you just look at those two factors alone, you can begin to see why quite often companies struggle with innovation. The third factor is that's how we've always done it. You know, human beings are pattern recognition engines. We're superbly good at looking at a set of occurrences and spotting a pattern. Unfortunately, quite often what we are doing is reading a pattern into things which have no pattern. And then what we do is we use that pattern to extrapolate scenarios into the future. And then we act on those scenarios as if they are true in order to create the future that we desire. But because it's nothing more than a projected pattern, quite often these things don't come true. And human beings have proved over the centuries to be really bad at predicting the future. And if you doubt that for one second, bear in mind that no one saw World War I coming. And no one thought that a minor nobleman being assassinated in a nondescript country that most people had never heard of could kick off the first ever modern global conflict. Now, of course, it seems self-evident because of all the other information we have access to. And that's what happens with innovation. You just don't actually know what's going to happen next. And so by limiting the number of people who are thinking creatively, coming up with ideas, joining the dots and making suggestions, you are hamstringing your company's ability to keep up with the times. And specialists, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jan, are a bit of a double-edged sword. Of course, they have deep knowledge on a particular subject, but what they don't often have is broad knowledge of many subjects across that. And what happens when you have really deep knowledge is your ideas may be absolutely wonderful and deeply innovative and startlingly good, but nobody else understands what the hell you're on about. And so it falls flat. You know, it's a bit like the tree in the, that fell over in the forest and no one was there to hear it. It's like, well, ugh, who cares? Um, which is why diversity is so important to innovation. A multitude of viewpoints from people with more or less experience, with more or less education, from different ethnic, economic, social, gender, sexual orientation, age, you name it. Because that way, again, you have a lot more dots from which you can join, which you can make a pattern where you can start to see where things could potentially go. Mm, that's, a, that's a wonderful, wonderful explanation. And I was thinking the other day about uh, TEDx. You know, uh, mm. I love the TEDx. Uh, we had TEDx here in Detroit. Obviously, we didn't have it this year, but I went last year and the year before, and I just loved it because your brain is going from one thing to another to another. You might be listening to somebody talking about a business-related issue, and then you're jumping to music, and then something else, and then maybe poetry, and you're all over the place. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing for a corporate team to do, yeah. to go to TEDx, right? Just because, just because you, you expose yourself to so many different things and you can think differently. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this, this didn't happen to me because I was actually out of my corporate job when I started going to TEDx, but I could just imagine 
going into the corporate world and saying, I want to take my team to TEDx. And the, the response being, what's the impact to the bottom line? If you yes. can't draw a direct impact between that expenditure and the bottom line, then it's not approved. It's like, well, just trust me. It's just because I want us to be in this more creative space so we can have conversations yeah. about stuff that somehow we'll be able to bring a little smidge of something back into the workplace, which could could possibly be the next greatest innovation on the planet. But people don't want to hear it when you say that. Well, when you say it like that, you can kind of understand why, because you're saying could, might, maybe. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if you exposed all of your people to that kind of thinking, they will come up with new and interesting ideas that will result in innovations that most certainly will have an impact on your bottom line. But it's a long-term thing. It's not going to happen overnight. And if you doubt that for one second, considering that something like the automotive industry is you know, pretty well established, quite traditional, lean. Lean was invented by Toyota, an auto manufacturer. Now you've got lean startup, you've got lean this, you've got lean that, you've got lean the next thing. Agile, right? A software development tool. Now you've got major retailers going agile because that way of thinking, that particular methodology developed for a particular industry was actually so clever that when you transplanted it to a different situation, a different industry, it created a whole new range of options that that industry had never seen before. And all of a sudden, things got better. That's why you should send your team to TEDx, because they could discover the next lean or the next agile, not necessarily the next wonderful widget, because creativity is a four-level construct. It's about processes, it's about people, it's about products, and it's about the environment or the press. So innovation can be just as much about fixing up your product as it can be about changing your process. And that's what a lot of people forget and miss when they start talking about innovation. Tell me a bit about the mantra on your website. I love it. Where did that come from? Tell us about that. Rebel, reject, create is my mantra. And it actually comes from a silly pay offline from a B-grade 80s movie uh, called Them, which was obey, conform, consume. And I used to have a t-shirt, you know, because I was a bit of a punker growing up and I found it, you know, beautifully tongue-in-cheek, sarcastically. Yeah, I'm not clever. surprised that you were a punk growing up, yeah. by the way. Yeah. And I was thinking about getting a new t-shirt because the one I had in the early nineties had clearly fallen apart by now. And I couldn't find it anywhere. And I thought, well, I'm just going to make one. And then it just struck me that actually that whole expression is so negative. You know, when I say obey, conform, consume, I'm making fun of the way that things are in order to make a point, which is that's, that's standing on the fence and, 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 and jeering and throwing eggs. And suddenly I wasn't comfortable with that anymore. So I asked myself, what is the complete opposite of obey, rebel, conform, reject, consume, oh, create? Now, most of the time people see that rebel, reject, create, and they think, oh yeah, yeah, you old punk rocker, you, this is all, you know, anarchy burning the place down. And that's actually not what it's all about. You need to rebel against your own way of doing things, of your patterns, of your habits, of your assumptions, your biases. You need to reject the status quo, the way we've always done it, the things that have absolutely no reason for being done a certain way. And once you've done all of that stuff, you then need to create a new way. And that's what it's really about. It's about stepping away from the known through rebellion and rejection so you can enter into a place which is ambiguous and complex enough for you to find new answers to old problems and to new ones. But I would think to do that, you've got to, first of all, be very comfortable in your own skin. And secondly, have the safe environment that you talk about. Well, you know, safety features in both of those conditions, doesn't it? It's, and that's not coincidental. You know, being creative is risky business. You're literally stepping into the unknown. And human beings hate the unknown. I mean, you know, that's why as a kid, you're scared of the dark. You 
don't know, you can't see, you don't know what's going to happen. That's why, you know, that's why micromanagement is so dangerous because it encourages people to stay so far inside the tracks that they don't even, um, they don't even achieve, you know, they just kind of meet the minimum requirement. And it's all about fear. They don't want to draw attention to themselves because they don't know what'll happen. And, and I think that's also why maybe creative people have a bit of a weird reputation out there in the world, because they're just on that level, people who are thoroughgoingly creative have learned to be quite fearless in a certain category. They've, they've learned that if I say something stupid while I was trying to figure something out, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. It doesn't mean I'm a failure. It doesn't, and, uh, you know, all that kind of negative self-talk, which we indulge in, especially around failure, um, creative people have somehow gotten a lot better at dealing with. And, you know, it's very, very cool and trendy at the moment to talk about failure as the new success, you know, these amazing nights where you, uh, you get up on stage and boast about how badly you failed, um, which is a pity because it, it masks a more fundamental truth that if you failed, it means you've, means you've tried. And if you've tried, you've learned something. Um, what I always say to people is that if you get something right the first time, what have you learned? So Absolutely true, nothing. right? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing, right? It's but true. if you failed, you've learned how not to do it. Then there's that fantastic Thomas Edison quote, which I'm going to mangle, but which basically uh, in response to like, wow, you're amazing. You invented the light bulb. He was like, well, first I discovered 2,995 ways how not to make a light bulb. Yeah. Um, and people forget always that part. We're so attracted to the magic, to the glitz, the rock and roll, the glam um, about creativity that people tend to overlook the fact that it, it is always preceded by a lot of grunt, collecting a lot of dots, building a lot of prototypes, failing a lot, and just trying again the next time and not letting any of that derail you. Yes, yes, that's so true. That's yeah. so true. You know, I've. I've not had that much exposure to what I would call real creatives, right, in in my life. But I did uh, have some exposure to the guy that built my website, who's incredibly creative. He, he's a, amazing. And, and I remember talking to him about the design of the website. And he said to me, you know, what music do you like? And I said, well, ACDC, you know, right. And he said, um, okay, he said, I'm going to listen to that when I'm working on your website and your branding. And I, I thought, oh, okay. And then I thought about it for a minute and I thought, well, that's brilliant. Of course, of course you would do that. He has to sort of channel me to get the whole brand of me and get a whole sense of who I am. So he, he really wanted to try and put himself in my head and in my shoes for a while, right? As right. he was designing it. And I thought, wow, that's that's brilliant. I would have never thought about that. And right. and you can see the results. You can see the little ACDC gothic lettering thread coming through, which is absolutely me. He nailed it. But the one thing I, I, I noticed was trying to manage him the way that I've managed every other supplier in my career. Oh, no, 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 no. no. You know, budgets and check-in points and timelines – no, you know, there was an ultimate end game. You know, there was a, there was a budget and there was an, a date when the thing had to be live. Well, I'm used to putting in milestone points along the way, right? I'm an ex automotive program manager, right? This is what I do. There are gate, gates and checkpoints and all this stuff that did not work at all. Now, thankfully I sensed it and I felt it early enough to to recognize it and pull back. But I've got to imagine that there's a lot of creative people out there, even in, you know, an industry as conservative as automotive, that are just are just paralyzed because they've got all this, all these um, requirements and check-ins and checklists yeah. around them. It's too restrictive, right? Right. Well, there's two things I want to pick up on from what you just said there. First of all is you, you mentioned about him saying, oh, what music are you into? I'm going to listen to that music when I'm designing your site. Now, earlier on, you mentioned authentic leadership. <sighs> so, okay, it's less true these days than it used to be when we were young, but your taste in music is deeply personal. And, you know, if you were born before the 90s, it's 
you know, probably identity forming. In other words, if someone designs something for you that centers around your music taste, it's going to reflect a deeper you than you probably project in your normal day-to-day -day business life. In other words, anyone who sees it will feel a connection to you, not your business, not your brand. And when we're talking about creativity and authentic leadership, this is what's important. Not the, the nine box blooming performance monitoring system or the meeting all the milestones. It's about connecting in a way that facilitates progress. And to pick up on the other thing about deadlines and monitoring, you can see a lot of that stuff as closed questions. Do you like chocolate? Yes, no right? When you have closed questions, you either get confirmation or denial. That's it. When you say, what do you like about chocolate? Or why do you like chocolate? You get a whole story. You get a lot more information. And being creative is a lot more like an open-ended question. Mm. So when you go for confirmation or denial, you stop the process. When you ask an open-ended question, you facilitate the process. So when your creative person comes back and says, I don't, well, whatever, you know, I've got this idea. And basically you're kind of going, I'm not sure if I, what, what do you want to listen to ACDC? Why? Instead of saying, but, say, and, but ACDC is really not corporate and I'm in the automotive industry. People aren't going to go for this. You say, well, and I'm also into the cure and a bit of Susie and the Banshees <laughs> and classical music. And they're like, oh, all of a sudden he's got a lot more to work with. You did not just mention Susie and the Banshees. I cannot believe you just mentioned that. Well, you mentioned, you, you said goth, not me. And um, if you're saying ACDC, we're talking same time period. And also, I saw your previous haircut, so definitely Susie and the Banshees. Really? <laughs> <laughs> she was a huge influencer of mine. <laughs> I, I, and I, I actually had to admit that I had to do a presentation the other day for an automotive organization, OESA, and they said, put something out there that nobody knows about you. And I actually put a picture of Susie out there and I said, I was influenced by Susie and the Banshees. So I can't believe that you just picked up on that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Joining the dots. I got wow. to touch her once. That's impressive. Yeah, reunion show somewhere in the mid nineties. I had to fight off five goth chicks to get close enough to touch her hand when she was singing, uh, I think, Israel. Yeah. She looks amazing. Have you seen pictures yeah. of her today? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a creative, right? You want to talk about creativity. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and this is the thing where it gets all mixed up, you know, because people think, oh, Susie and the Banshees, punk rock, huge makeup, weird music, that's creative. And they, and they quietly forget that on a neurological level, what your accountant does when he pulls together all your annual financial information and tries to fit it into the funnel of what the receiver of revenue wants He's also being creative. Yes. You know, he might not it, have spiky hair or thigh length boots, but he's definitely being creative. Right. Because it doesn't just fit. It's not a cookie cutter process. He's got to interpret. He's got to extrapolate. He's got to join the dots from what he knows and what he knows you did last time. And he's got to make some assumptions and in order to be able to do what he has to do. And we all do this every single day. I mean, every single one of us, whether we're sitting at our desk or going to work, are solving problems. And what do you do when you solve a problem? You generate an answer. Did the answer exist before? Well, not for you. Therefore, you created it essentially out of nothing. You had element A, element B, and you went, well, if A is true and then B is true, but I need to get to D, then I must go via C. Ah, there we go. There's the answer. That's new. It's new to you. And you made it. And that's what human beings do on all sorts of levels. And where it starts, where people get confused is they start confusing the skills that we drive through the creative capacity for the process. So if you're good at drawing, what makes you a great artist is your skill plus the creative capacity. 
if you're an incredible entrepreneur who's constantly coming up with cutting edge new products and things for the market, your skill is a business skill that goes through the process of creativity. And just because a business entrepreneur doesn't look like a punk rocker, so many people don't call them creative. Mm, it's and, a label, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And it's a, yes. it's, it's a misconception. It's a fundamental misunderstanding. And, but the thing is, is though you can't, like you were talking about your web designer, you can't control creativity. You can't measure it because it involves the conscious rational mind, as well as our subconscious unconscious mind. You know, our rational minds are able to access X amount of information. Our unconscious minds are able to access hundreds of times more information than that. And it works a lot slower. So when a challenge gets through to your unconscious mind, it takes a long time to process. And then eventually one day, two weeks later, you're in the shower and you go, oh, I've got the answer. It's magic. An angel reached down from the cloud and touched me on the head and said, Dave, I have the answer for you. Because we're so unused to that notion that that is actually an alternative function of our brain. But it is. It's not divine intervention. It's not the muses. It's, it's not even the drugs you're taking. It's your subconscious working through vast swathes of information in order to come up with an answer to your problem. Your rational mind follows rules, logic, rationality, day-to-day -day reason, quite linear stuff. Your unconscious quite happily flicks through all sorts of random stuff, bangs it into each other to see what happens. That's why your dreams are so crazy, psychedelic, schizo. Because your brain is bringing things together that ordinarily wouldn't belong together. And that's how you come up with really super duper innovative ideas, is by getting them into your unconscious. And that's why you can't be on the clock. And that's what freaks management out. Yes. <laughs> now, why is it that a lot of these creative ideas come out in the shower? Because, I mean, we, we joke about it, but it is true. Mm -hmm. oh, I say it for a very good reason. Well, neurological research says that in order to get into a creative state of mind, you need to meet four conditions. Number one, you need to be, uh, you have to have inward quiet. In other words, your brain can't be doing too much. You can't be th thinking too much because every time you, you have thoughts, neurons fire. And in order just to think about what you're going to have for lunch, several tens of thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of neurons fire. But the amount of neurons that fire when you make a connection, when you have an aha moment, is in the thousands. So if you're thinking too much about too much stuff, you literally will not hear it. So you have to have internal quiet. Second of all, you have to be inward looking. You know, just busy with your thoughts not distracted by the printer or, or Jane at the coffee machine or John at the printer, inward looking, busy with what you already have with what's going on. Third condition, you have to be slightly happy. In other words, not unhappy, not stressed, not angry, just content. And the last one, you mustn't try too hard. So when you're in the shower, you're definitely not trying too hard because you've showered quite a few times before, you know what to do. It requires no effort. You're definitely slightly happy because it's warm and the negative ions have a positive recharging inf influence on your body. You're cocooned in a little cabin. It's refreshing. You're definitely happy. You are slightly inward looking because you're in there alone and line of sight is limited and, and all you've got is, and, and what you're doing is automated. So it's not requiring any externally focused thoughts whatsoever. And of course you have mental quiet because there's no stimuli and there's no one else there. And so when you've quietened everything down, your subconscious goes, Oh, by the way, here's that thing you asked for. <laughs> so walking the dog, doing the ironing, long distance driving, exercising, anything you do so much that the actual action you're completing is automated, requires no conscious focus. Your 
conscious mind kind of goes, oh, I'm so bored. And it starts to basically shut up. Your unconscious mind finally is able to bully its way to the front and make itself heard. Wow. Compare that to your average day at the office. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, <laughs> that's powerful. That's a lot to think about. Yeah. So for business leaders out there, you know, I, I know that you run a, a workshop. And yeah. when I look at that, I think a creativity workshop. Mm. What the heck is that? I yeah. can't even imagine what it would be, you know, what, how it would work and what the output would be. And I'm not looking for, you know, an impact to the bottom line. I'm just, I just can't even get my mind around it. So yeah. uh, educate me and others, please. What yeah. is a creativity workshop? Well, essentially, there are two breeds of animal that fall under my creative workshop heading. And the first breed is literally turning ordinary people into weapons of mass creation, getting them to understand what creativity is, how it actually works, and then how to use it. What habits do you need to acquire? What skills do you need? Um, what conditions do you need to meet? And then giving people techniques in order to facilitate them getting that. The idea being is that everyone who walks out of that workshop is far better equipped to get into a creative mind state on a reliable, predictable basis in order to solve better, solve problems, come up with better ideas, and so on and so on. The second one is a lot more goal-directed, where a company, for example, may be struggling with a particular problem that requires a creative solution, and they're just not getting there. That would be a different process where I would facilitate using all the tools and the tricks and the, and the mind state stuff that I know in order to take that team through the process of exploring the challenge until such time as we come up with an answer. Mm, okay. That's fascinating. Yeah. So tell me about um, a, a client or a leader, perhaps in a business that you've seen who you would say really understands creativity. I mean, you don't, I'm not asking you to name them, but just tell me the, the kind of person they are and how they do it. Well, mostly creative leaders create a culture of innovation by walking the walk. You know, by, by being open enough to be creative themselves and by thereby holding a space for others to do it. And I think if we look at the early days of companies like Google uh, and weirdly enough, Gore-Tex, um, where, yeah, you know, Gore-Tex also had this whole thing where you could decide what team you wanted to be in and the team could decide whether they wanted you or not. And you could change teams halfway through a project based on your motivations, your interests, and those of the people in the team. You know, that's not typical management structures whatsoever. You know, no, but I love it. Right. So it's focusing on outputs as opposed to measuring hours. Um, so leaders who are successfully able to do this, first of all, make sure that the environment that their people step into is conducive, that it's not a gray cubicle farm, that there are interesting things to look at. And again, this has been abused terribly when you walk into these hipster offices with a foosball table and, and sleep hummocks. And, but you realize very quickly that there is no culture of innovation there because, oh my God, nobody ever sleeps in the hammocks. And only after five o'clock does anyone ever play foosball because the management is going, oh, look at that, another two hours wasted. Um, if there was a real culture of innovation there, that equipment would be utilized on an ongoing, regular, interchangeable basis. So, you know, when you start talking about a culture of innovation and a leader which is, who is able to nurture that, you're not talking about window dressing. You're talking about actual behaviors. You know, there's a great, and I would, damn, I can't remember who said this, but it's like, you want to know what your company culture is? Just look at the way things are currently being done. Forget the manifesto, forget the mission statement. If you want to know what your company culture is, just look at how people are interacting with each other. And so if people are routinely suspicious and guarded and, and, and value their privacy and are highly competitive, you know that you don't have the kind of open environment where the cross-collaboration and joining of the dots that a culture of innovation requires is actually possible. Do you think it's possible for these conservative companies to change and get there? Yes, I do. I do. Um, it, 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 
what it requires is a change in mindset and and you know a really frank acknowledgement that actually the old ways of doing things just aren't delivering what they're used to you know the people who are coming into the workforce just don't behave the way that people coming into the workforce 20 years ago did the people buying your products don't value the same things that the people buying your products 20 years ago did so why are you still doing things the same way you did 20 years ago it's cognitive dissonance on a massive scale and one needs to overcome one's ego and one's attachment to this safe familiar ground um, and realize that if you do not do that you are closely related to the captain of the titanic <laughs> because you know up until then that's how you sail through icebergs you know full speed <laughs> yeah and it was only after that that people suddenly went oh maybe we should change and you know the classic example of this is the music industry you know a bunch of swedes invented the mp3 and all of a sudden it was possible to share music files over the internet on a dial-up connection and what did the music industry do well they try to criminalize it they try to sue everybody they try to shut it down but there's a fundamental rule of business the moment a new piece of technology hits your industry the old business model becomes obsolete and you need to find a new one the music industry didn't and that's why we only have I think it's now down to three major labels left. And that's why there is nowhere near as much money in the record industry as there was during the 80s, any time between the 60s and the 80s. And the music industry can whine and scream and, and blame piracy everything they want. But in actual fact, it's their own stupid fault because they just went full speed ahead and damn the icebergs. And, you know, publishing was precariously close to following the same path as were newspapers. But they seem to have just learnt in the nick of time and are adapting and changing. Mm. You know, the automotive industry actually, you know, faces identical problems sooner or later. No one's going to want a car because there'll be self-driving things that you can hail at the drop of a hat using your app on your phone. And what is the point of owning a car? You don't have to, don't have to pay for parking, you don't have to pay for insurance, you don't have to pay for maintenance, you don't have to pay for fuel, blah, 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 blah. You know, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands now, there's a thing called swap feats, literally swap bike, where you pay 10 euros a month to be able to use a bike. And if you get a puncture, if it breaks, you just call them up, they come and take it away and give you a new one. So over the course of two years, you've spent exactly what you would have spent on a reasonable bike anyway. But no one cares because they don't want to own a bike. And I know in America right now, that with reference to cars is possibly quite hard to believe, but it's already happening in Europe and it will get there. And the question is, what on earth are car makers gonna do when that happens? Yes, well, we're seeing some of that already. We're seeing vehicles uh, coming out. Uh, Canoe is talking about a vehicle that's going to be subscription only. Yeah. That's it. You can't buy it. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't buy it. And these EV car companies that we see starting up tend to be technology companies who are taking the technology and putting it into a vehicle. You know, yeah. where I am in Detroit, as you all know, we're experts on the vehicle, and then we try to put the technology in the vehicle. Yeah. And it's very, very different because the, the culture and the mindset in California is very different to the culture and the yeah. mindset here in Detroit. So it's it's the merging together of these two worlds that we see happening. It's unfolding uh, in front of our eyes right now. Yep. But I have to say, I love it when I go to um, Amsterdam. In my last job, we had a, a supply chain office in Amsterdam, and I loved going to Amsterdam because there's a there's a, a vibe, a feeling that's much more open, much more high tech. And then you come out of the airport and you get picked up in a Tesla taxi, right? There was a yep. Tesla cab, yep. I think and it was right there. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hugely subsidized by the Amsterdam uh, municipality. And I like your example there about these, these um, sort of tech startups who are you know doing cars that are all about the tech, not so much about the car. Um, 
because it also brings to mind another classic example in the music industry. You know, one of the biggest things that broke the major labels, which completely destroyed the business model of the music industry, was the iPod. It was Apple, a bunch of tech heads. You know, and Steve Jobs closed the deal with the major labels to get as much music on those iPods as possible, which, <laughs> which was obscene. You know, the, the record company executives just so didn't understand what was going on that they signed away stuff at rates that they should never, ever have agreed to. And as a result, Apple was able to pole vault into the lead on the whole digital music front and actually have more power than all the major labels combined because the record labels just kind of on purpose remained ignorant and fought against this thing. <clears throat> and again, you know, that's, that's the risk that any industry faces. I mean, consider 3D printers. Pretty soon, you know, you're going to have a, a bunch of carbon fiber in a big box in the corner of your house and a, and a, and a, and a carbon printer. You know, when you, when you want a new pair of shoes, you're going to go online and you're going to buy the pattern. And you're going to open that file up and you're going to press print and you'll get your new pair of running shoes here on your printer next to you. What then for delivery services? What for shopping malls? What for sales reps? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I don't think anyone's going to carbon print a car anytime soon, but all it requires is an apple to make an electronic vehicle that catches the imagination of the current public in a way that a normal car doesn't, and the whole industry is screwed. Yes, yes. So why and, isn't the industry ex exploring this in the most aggressive way imaginable? Well, let's and let's talk about that. Let's talk about timing, right? So creativity and innovation has been on every agenda it, yeah. for decades. Okay. We're in a pandemic. I think we we both believe that this pandemic is indeed an accelerator for change. It is it is a, a, a catalyst. I mean, for transformation because people people's minds are more open now than ever before to change because their whole lives of everything they've ever known has been torn apart. They couldn't even get toilet paper and groceries. So you know they're working from home. That in some cases that was never heard of in some companies. Now they're embracing it. So I think people people are are ready for change. It's like it's like they're they're right there. This transformation of work is is happening right now. So now is the time. So for these companies that don't want to get left behind to To really understand your subject area, to understand creativity, innovation, and more importantly, do something about it now. Yeah. Because a year from now, it's going to be too late. Right. I mean, and it takes us straight back to Toyota. Um, you know, lean, okay, great. But the other great thing that came out of Toyota was Kaizen, incremental change. You know, every day, do one thing slightly better. And, you know... Yeah, incremental change doesn't lead to massive innovation, except if you do one little thing and your entire workforce is doing one little thing better every single day, it does. Because innovation is a bit like evolution. You know, it kind of tickles along and not much changes and you have some aberrations and then suddenly, boom, it's off the charts because it all comes together. But if, you, if you're not on the bus... It, it's just not going to happen to you. You, you. you can have as many innovation teams and factories and specialists and consultants as you like, but until you harness the intellectual capital of your entire workforce, who, especially in the automotive industry, is incredibly diverse, you know, at least half of your workforce is your target market. Yeah. So if you don't know what the audience wants, ask your workforce. Yeah, that's a, that's so true. That's so true. And, and Do you believe? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was and start doing it. You know, start working on it now. Who cares if it's all a complete disaster? You're hemorrhaging money anyway. You might as well write some of it off to R and D. <laughs> Do you believe that now is the time? No. Uh, not as in the pandemic is the time. I, I believe yes. Now is the time because now is always the time. Um, what I've come to realize is that it's not about being more creative or about innovation or about motivation or about leadership or about skills. It's about starting. 
it's always about starting because once you've started things change and once you've started changing things will continue to change and you'll be forced to play catch up so the fundamental principle is to take the first step and then to keep showing up and then the rest of the stuff kind of takes care of itself but you've got to have someone keeping you honest keeping on showing up and making sure that those steps are actually taken mm, yeah that's true do you believe that people are more receptive to change now that we've been through this shared struggle of the pandemic and therefore perhaps more open to creativity and, and allowing that creative side out? Or do you think there's no, no relationship there? Difficult to say. I, the cynical side of me says, no, it's purely a response to necessity. Um, and that once we're back in some form of a comfort zone, a lot of people will revert to type and, yeah. um, and go back into their shells because the people around them will revert to type and it'll become too dangerous to be creative and to express yourself, you know, socially uh, dangerous rather than physically. Um, however, it would appear that a significant proportion of the population has suddenly discovered the power of creativity, the power it has to um, connect you with purpose, to give you a sense of control over your own destiny to give you choices and options that you didn't realize you had. Um, and that is like opium, you know, I think there is. And so massive change is never precipitated by the majority, it just requires a tipping point. So the optimist in me says, maybe enough people have been turned on for us to be approaching a tipping point. A few years ago, I discovered WeWork. I'm sure you're familiar with WeWork. Yes. It's a global chain. Yeah, and I went there and I would uh, go there a couple of times a month away from my corporate job just because, you know, WeWork, it's a creative environment. It's different. It's a different vibe. It was in the city. It's in Detroit. And I loved going there because my, my head was in a different place. You know, mm. my energy was different and I loved it. And I remember that my boss at the time really had trouble understanding, you know, why, why I would want to leave the so-called comfort of the corporate office to go down to this environment where all these youngsters were and, and who knows, you know, what he thought was actually going on there. I mean, there's a, a beer tap that you can have a beer any time of the day and night, you know. That. And I think that sometimes these corporate leaders think, oh my gosh, if I unleash all these creative types, there's just going to be this chaos and people yeah. are going to be running around, you know, and there's going to be no control and and then how am I going to run a business? So what, what do you say to the leaders? leaders out there that may have some of those concerns. Yeah, well, th they've often also fallen victim to one of the major myths about creativity. You know, I'm an extraordinarily creative human being. You know, I, I sculpt in stone, I draw, I make music, I write poetry, I consult, I, I do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But I get up at the same time every single day and I have a very strictly color-coded diary which I use to coordinate everything that I do according to quite strict milestones and... Uh, uh, one of those things, deadlines. Right. You know, creative people don't come in one shape and size and variety. There are all sorts of types of creative people. There's big picture detail. There's um, high detail people. There's people who are only really interested in the end goal. There's people who are interested in the process. There's people who are interested in the tools. There's people who are interested in the people. So on that, first of all, there's no guarantee that just because you've activated your entire staff to now be creative, that they're all going to turn into Jimi Hendrix and start throwing TVs out of hotel windows and taking heroin. The other thing is that, you know, I, I've said it a few times during the course of this conversation, creativity is about joining the dots. In other words, in order to be creative, you need to spend a fair amount of time obtaining dots. And that involves working, reading, studying, researching, and experimenting. You know, all credible business activities, basically. Um, and it's not like it's an always on black or white kind of a thing. Um, you know, becoming creatively activated is a bit like 
<laughs> a bit like taking these neurotropic vitamins. The idea is that it kind of just throws everything into a slightly different, sharper focus, where instead of like doing your nut and having hallucinations and being wild and uncontrollable, it's just giving you overall better insights into what you're doing and seeing the connections between things better, making you more effective, not necessarily more efficient, but more effective. And if you're interested in outcomes rather than just efficiency, isn't that what you want? So I think, unfortunately, and it is a common reaction that people are like, whoa, you know, I don't want a mass of unmanageable people on my hands. It's a massive generalization informed by a huge ignorance about what creativity actually is. And, and you know, rooted in a stereotype about creatives that is actually about artists, you know, and in particular rock and roll stars, you know, not about creative human beings. I mean, no one would really have a problem with Elon Musk types working for them you know, workaholics who just never stop and are always coming up with amazing stuff. But that man is insanely creative. And he's a scattergun. He's all over the place into all sorts of interesting things. But he's brutally effective. I mean, you know, notwithstanding whatever <clears throat> shortcomings might be packaged into that on other areas. But you know what it is? It's a polarization. It's, mm. it's a classic anti-creative response. It's basically saying, this is the rule of order. And if it's not the rule of order, well, it must be chaos. And creativity is about the grays in between, the complexity, yes. the ambiguity. It's not about chaos. That's just a, an unfortunate effect of our social media environment. If you're not with me, you got to be against me. You can't possibly be just interested in something else. And it extends in so many directions. And creativity is a big victim of that kind of black and white polarized thinking. Yeah, that's beautifully said. Thank you. <laughs> beautifully said. Yes. Wow. You've, you've really you've pushed me in my thinking today. Good. You, you really have. You've stretched me and, and made me think deeper. And that's the reason I wanted you, you know, on the podcast, because this is your field. This is what you understand better yeah. than anybody else I've ever come across um, that even, you know, can even talk about creativity for more than 10 seconds. You, you <laughs> know it. You, you just know it. It's ingrained in you. It's in your DNA. You believe it. You practice it. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on something about how you start your day and I'm always interested in how successful people start their day. So would you tell us a little bit more about how you start your day? I like to get up really early. Um, I'm, a, I'm a terrible early bird. Uh, whether that's nature or nurture, I'm not sure. My father was an early bird. But I found if I'm on my computer at 5 a.m., by the time 9 a.m. rolls around, I've done four hours work. But that's not true. I've spent four hours working. I've done eight hours work. Um, and then when everyone else is starting their working day, I've done my work and now I'm available to do all sorts of other interesting stuff, you know? So it's, it's a beautiful way of clearing the decks of my obligations and setting me free to then go on adventures. Mm. And I find if I do not get a running start to my morning, I've just gotten so used to having a running start to my morning that if I don't get one, the rest of my day is in big danger of falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And how you start your day is everything. Either you set it up for success or you set it up for failure. Yeah. And uh, I run an accountability lab uh, every morning. I run two of them now. One's at 6.30 in the morning, one's at 7.07. .07. And we talk every day about a commitment for the day. And one thing that we've learned is that we need to get the big thing that we're going to do that day done right away. Because you, otherwise, you know, you, you, you never get to it. You get distracted. So we focus on getting that done right away. And then you've got the rest of the day yep. to do, you know, maybe other things. If you want to spend time on social media, that's okay. If you want to walk the dog or whatever you want to do, you know, you, you yeah. can do it, right? And you don't have that, that thing hanging over you. 
Um, so, yeah, it's, I just think it's fascinating how people yeah. start their days. What time do you get up? I get up at 5. What time do you get up? Yeah, now more like 5.30 because I've still got two okay. pretty small kids. So my yeah. sleep isn't always what I'd like it to be. But there's one thing I've added to that, which is that if I don't get it done, I forgive myself. Mm. You know, because first of all, just spending the rest of the day beating yourself up about not having gotten up early enough to do X, Y, and Z is just counterproductive. But more importantly, because I know that tomorrow I'm going to get up at the same time and I'm going to go at it again because I've been doing it my entire adult life and I know it's going to happen. So even if I've missed it three days in a row, I still take it easy on myself because I know I will. Yes, I I think we, you know, we chase this elusive to-do list, right? Because we want that dopamine hit, right? We want it yeah. we want to be able to to check things off the task list. And so it's much easier to get all the little stuff off the list uh, so we can get that dopamine hit that we love so much instead of going to the big things first. And that's and and then you if you don't finish everything on your list, then you feel bad. And it's like, why do you chase these lists? I seriously don't have a to-do list. I don't have a task list. I have it. I mean, a lot of it's in my head, which is t typical entrepreneur, right? Um, but I schedule blocks of time for important things. Yeah, me too. And, and that's the only way that I, I can do it. You know, that's the space. That's where I'm going to be in the space, in the right head space to deal with that issue. And it's usually in the morning because that's when I'm, I'm at my yeah. best in the morning. Yeah. And it, it just, it works. Yeah, so here's a tip, right? Um, spend a couple of day, uh, weeks observing yourself not during a normal day and take particular note of the times of day when you are doing whatever you're doing almost effortlessly. You know, the work is just flowing, you're solving the problems, you're, whatever it is that you're busy with, it just happens with what appears to be the minimal effort and you're doing top quality work. And make a mental note of what time of day that is and see if it's more or less the same time every day. Mostly it is. Then the trick is to schedule the really important work for that time of day. So in other words, I don't have meetings. I don't make phone calls during my golden hours of the morning. I do all of that stuff in the afternoon because I don't need to be my 100% golden optimal self to do that stuff. But when I'm creating content and I'm writing a new book, I'm generating a training program, I need to be as sharp as I possibly can. And so I reserve that time for that act. It just happens yeah, to be early I, in the morning. I, I, I do much the same. I agree with you. I think my time is about eight to 10. You know, that's, that's it. Cause I like to work up, work out in the morning, run the accountability labs. Cause I like that, that connection in the morning and that, that, it, that gives me a boost in the morning. And then I, then I make a cup of tea cause it got, you know, I'm a Brit. Remember I got up my tea. So I have a cup of tea and then I'm, I'm in, I'm on, you know, I feel good and I'm ready to, to get into, to something really meaty and then meetings then in the rest of the afternoon, it's yeah. whatever, whatever happens, happens in the afternoon. Indeed. Okay. Um, so I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to your 25-year-old self in today's environment? Practice your guitar more. <laughs> Seriously. The thing I've learned is that, and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not a massive acolyte of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours of mastery, but the more you do something, as long as you're focused on improving that thing, the better you will get. I started playing guitar in 1987. If I had just played 20 minutes, Monday to Friday, every week from then till now, I'd be wiping the floor with Jimi Hendrix. But because I didn't, I can still barely string four chords together and I have to practice for weeks to be able to play a song without making mistakes. And that I regret. But more importantly, I regret not, in, not ro rooting that discipline and that notion deeper in my life. I've managed to acquire it in other areas, but it's been hard work when actually it could have been a lot easier work when I was 25. Mm, yes. Yeah, that's right. And how do you see your legacy? What are you bringing to this world? How, how do you want to leave this world? What's your legacy? I have no idea at this stage. Um, Look, I, I'm, I've embarked into a field that is littered with neuroscientists and professors of psychology 
and top end, highly experienced business consultants and what have you, all talking about creativity and innovation. And I'm just this, this, this punk rocker poet who's combining my hands on experience of working with creativity and creative people for the last 30 years with their written works. So I don't hope to leave a legacy of anything special about my insights into creativity, but what I do hope to be able to do is to be able to translate a lot of that stuff, which is not always that easily understandable into deeply practical, adoptable methodologies that actually change people's lives. That would be cool. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you're very, you know, you're very authentic. You are who you are, right? You're obviously very comfortable in your own skin. You, you know, your, your subject matter at a depth and breadth that I have never seen. And I, I can't wait to see how your business evolves and, and how this, you know, creating this weapon of mass creation, how that evolves over time. It's been an absolute pleasure spending time with you today and exploring the subject of creativity and innovation. David Chislett, thank you. Likewise. Thank you, Jan. It's been awesome. <laughs> If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and you found something of value that will help you on your quest for your gravitas, then please share with your friends and colleagues and subscribe. Visit us at gravitasdetroit.com to find out more.